Hello everyone. In this video we're going to talk about getting the best possible sound out of the piano by paying very particular attention to something that is often neglected and that of course is the left hand. Now for today's video we're particularly interested in the left hand and we're going to take this left hand part of this nocturne. Uh, like so many nocturnes uh, it alternates bass and then kind of this chord stuff. Uh, we have, uh, like in Opus 9, number 2, we have bass and then two chords and a triplet. Uh, in Opus 48, number 1, we have bass and then chord. And here we have bass and then a few chords. So uh, here is what we want to talk about today. And, and uh, we might just call this a two-hand trick. I don't like the word trick because it sounds short and cheap and like you're escaping from any real work. <laughs> You're avoiding doing the difficult thing. And uh, this is not that at all. This is actually delving into the difficult thing and embracing it. And the idea is very, very simple. You just take the left hand part and you play it with two hands as though it is a piece unto itself. And so I might start this nocturne like this. Now, because I'm leaving out the melody and giving all my attention to this left hand part, presumably I will notice things I would not have noticed if I was just blasting along playing all the notes. And in particular, what I notice is there's a, uh, a supporting melody contained within this left hand, this wonderful... Okay. That's fantastic. So this little E flat D idea. Now, I already feel like I have uh, a little bit of insight into it because it feels like the E flat is a little bit stronger. Like we're going toward it and then away and then toward it and then away from it and so on. Okay, so it's like a uh, leaning into the E flat. Uh, also, I immediately notice, and this is very, very cool, that each time I get to the E flat, I have a different chord. <laughs> and I love the sound of each of those. And then this time, different chords talk about that in a moment. So what this is getting me to do, first of all, is to bring out this tenor line just a little bit more. Uh, and what I might do uh, if I were not paying attention, and what, uh, what you often hear students do is... is just uh, kind of honk out the whole thing, and, and this is uh, an indication that they're just not paying attention. Okay, so the two-hand trick is a way of paying special attention. Uh, by the way, this little melody continues, and when I get to here, this is the, uh, it's an F7 chord. It's a dominant of B flat, and I'm going to arrive in B flat here. So if I start in the third measure... this uh, and that's a, a suspension okay because the real chord is that and so the G is a suspension but if you know music you know that suspensions are normally prepared by common tone well there's your common tone right back there it happens in the G so I just want to hear that a little bit See, I want that G.
prepared. Even though, yes, I'm going to change the pedal on this beat and that G will vanish, it will still be in my memory. And so it's just smoothed over as a preparation. Okay, it's subtle things like this that make all the difference in piano tone. When people say things like so and so has a warm sound, or a round sound, or a legato sound, or an expressive sound, it's, those are just generalizations. And what they're really talking about is specific little details like taking care of that. Okay, so let's hear this now with the melody, and I'm going to try to work this that little idea in. So of course the melody is going to take precedence. And especially over the bar line, what I don't want to do is too much bass so that I lose this sound. I want to keep your ear. Okay, so you hear, hopefully you can hear um, that the sound is clear and developing and so on. Um, by the way, right there, that stepwise motion, here's the thing a student would do. All right, listen to that sound. Is that a good sound or a bad sound? It's neither, because there's really not such a thing as good or bad sounds. There's just appropriate and inappropriate. Uh, and appropriate is uh, showing what I want to show in the music. And what I want to show in the music is these voices moving. But if I go like this, those voices are completely blended together and I can't tell where they're going. So it's kind of a bad sound. So instead what I want is clarity. So I'm not going to pedal through those. And noticing this kind of stuff is very, very typical of uh, left hand, the, the two hand trick. By the way, I got this from my teacher Raymond Hansen, uh, the magnificent uh, teacher who passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, I specifically remember when he told me I was playing the Franck Prelude uh, Chorale and Fugue, and there was just some octaves, a theme in octaves. And I, I imagine I was probably just slamming them and not really listening to them. And he made me play octaves with two hands like this. And he said, get the absolute best sound that you can just on those octaves. Don't pardon any ugliness or crudeness just because it's a left hand part or because it's low or because it's an octave or whatever. Make it as good as a piano can sound. And what I realized is that I, I needed to voice a little bit to the top and, and back off here. And then, of course, also phrase the shape of the line. And um, it was that attention to detail that really um, changed my playing. And I, I owe him for that. He was a magnificent teacher. Uh, so before we go on, let's sum up a little bit. First of all, if you want to sound good at this instrument, uh, it, it's a lot of work to do it, and uh, it takes time, and it takes an investment of effort. Is it okay just to bash out something on the piano? Of course it's okay to bash out something on the piano. Um, just like it's okay to sing happy birthday out of tune in a restaurant. The point is not a beautiful performance. The point is it's just socially fun. And there's nothing wrong with socially fun music that doesn't sound that great. I'm not against it. I'm actually all for it. Um, I love little kids singing out of tune and amateurs and all of that. However, when it comes time to play at a higher artistic level, the, the rules are just different. Okay, so first of all, sound, your sound at the instrument comes from your imagination. You are not going to get any sound that you do not imagine and intend. You're not going to get anything good by accident. Okay, there's pretty much no accidents. Uh, it's, it comes from intention at the piano. Um, like a painting, comes from an image that you have, like I'm looking at a landscape or I imagine something. If I just start dabbing paint on the canvas with no particular plan and no particular intention, of course it's not going to look like anything. It's just going to be a dark smudge. 
So you have to have ideas about your sound. You can't just say, well, the, the little page says poke the different buttons at these times, so I will. Um, is that terrible and wrong? No, it's okay at an amateur level. But if you want your sound to be beautiful, it's really not enough. So sound comes from imagination. Your sound will never be better than your imagination. If you haven't thought about how a passage sounds, you don't sound good. Okay? Just like if I bake something for you and I haven't thought about how it's supposed to taste, it will not taste good. Okay? It only comes from me intending for it to taste good. So if you haven't thought about your sound, your sound is probably garbage. Okay, let's look at one more example here, again in Chopin, but this is applicable to almost anything. Here we are in the C minor nocturne, opus 48, number one, also Chopin. This is a really interesting situation with the left hand. Again, we would be well advised to play it by itself. So again, we have this kind of moving top of the inner chords. Very typical of Chopin. My, my, uh, one of my teachers told me, in Chopin, everything is polyphonic. Everything's a line, even if it's a bunch of separated you know, chords in the left hand or something. Everything's linear. Everything's polyphonic. What's so interesting about this is that it follows the main line a little bit and then diverges from it. So these are the same. And same, same, and now they diverge. And now they're together again. That's just so interesting. It's like an orchestral doubling, right? Now it's going to diverge. Now it's there. sound okay so what I'm discovering here by taking the left hand and playing it by itself is there's a very unusual strategy of doubling for a little while and then going off by itself and then again it doubles just for a moment here and then goes off by itself so I'm gonna chase that idea down and, and see is you know is there some special insight into what Chopin's doing like these momentary alignments uh, the, if you will, momentary parallel octaves for an effect, uh, as well as just finding out any, uh, you know, interesting suspensions, um, uh, melodic stuff that happens in the inner voices. So uh, I recommend this all the time to my students to take two hands and play the left hand part and get it as beautiful as you can. Uh, it also just helps you technically to understand textures, um, to phrase 
melodies, secondary melodies that are in the left hand, and this is particularly true in composers like Rachmaninoff, where often there are two melodies going at the same time. And if you haven't separated them out and considered them individually, it's likely that you've not really been completely uh, attentive to it. And then finally, I would say even in other styles, so let's take Mozart, for example, Alberti basses. And, you know, those of us who teach, we've all heard somebody do something really gauche, like... Just a really violent, uh, inattentive left hand. Uh, and I would even take an Alberti and put it in two hands. And, and just try to, what kind of sound can I get, you know? First of all, the, the first note is the bass. We've talked about Alberti's before, but I'll just review it here. Et cetera, whatever. whatever. So you can hear there's kind of a layered quality to it. And uh, I would play that by itself and pretend it's a piece of music. And just how, how interesting and beautiful can it be? Um, and all it is is a texture and it's a harmony and it's a rhythm. And do uh, you ever look at something that um, is crafted way better than it needs to be? Like a tabletop. Like a tabletop doesn't have to be beautiful to function. It can just be a slab of wood or uh, any other surface, you know, some kind of synthetic surface or glass or whatever. And it will hold your plate and your cup and your newspaper and it'll be fine. But when you when you see... A, a tabletop, let's say of really fine woodwork. There's maybe some inlays, some cool grains, and uh, finish, and so on. Uh, it's unnecessary. You know, it's over the top. It's more than is needed to be functional, but it, it is great beauty. And there is an art to taking something very simple and functional and, and elevating it with beauty. And that's kind of how I feel about the Alberti. It's such a such a workhorse, you know. It's such a mule on a farm uh, made to do chores. Um, but you can make it very, very beautiful with craft. And again, the, the two-handed approach is a wonderful way to do that. So I would even I would even recommend, you know, take your Albertis in your in your Mozart or your Beethoven and and play them all by themselves. And what would you do if that was all there was to the music? How would you play it? If you were trying to get it to be the best that it could ever be uh, with two hands. And then you go back and you see if now with one hand you can duplicate that idea. And in this way, you can get better and better sound at the piano. And we'll see you next time in some other video. Ciao.